We've been road tripping in Israel. What an amazing travel destination it is. In the first part of our journey, we soaked in the culture and history in Jerusalem. And then got soaked in the Dead Sea. We enjoyed nature and wildlife along some of the most fabulous driving roads in the desert from the Dead Sea to the Red Sea. Now, if you haven't already seen that, look for part one of this travelogue. In this half, I take you on another exotic journey from the Red Sea to the Med Sea. Yes, we're heading up to the Mediterranean. And it began with a sunset drive on a fabulous road. Now this road from Elat to Mitzpe Ramon is a really lovely road, well surfaced, nice winding corners, fantastic views of these Martian landscape like hills around Elat. And the entire road runs along the Egyptian border, so you run along the fencing with the Egyptian border. And you can see that entire fencing now on my left. The road that snakes up from Ela towards the Egyptian border is straight out of an enthusiast's dream. The evening sun ignites the red mountains, creating life affirming sights. And once you reach the top of the hills, you get a fantastic view of Ela. Right up here on the hill, you have a fantastic view of Elat city and the Red Sea. But it's interesting because the hills that you see in the distance, that's Jordan. Right in between here is Israel and of course Elat city and the Red Sea. And if you look to my left and you see the fencing, we're right here at the border and that side is Egypt. If I thought the views on the way up were great, the ones the coastline served up to us on the way down were on a different level. It was a burst of elemental colours, the blue ocean, the red mountains, a crimson sky that left me speechless once again. And of course, after catching a glimpse of the blue waters, I had to head for the beach. From the Dead Sea to the Red Sea in the C class has been my journey today and what a wonderful day it has been. I took a short dip, well not even a dip, just walked into the Red Sea because it's just so much colder than the Dead Sea. I had no courage to go right in. And I have no idea why it's called the Red Sea because coming into Elat, we just saw these wonderful shades of blue that it looks like. Well. It is the Red Sea because I believe at sunset it takes on a hue of red and we'll have to see about that. But we are in Elat, which is, like all beach towns, a party place, bars, pubs, restaurants and a great nightlife and it is also a free trade zone in Israel. The curtains came down on an action-packed day at the charming Pedro restaurant in Elat, which serves great steaks and ceviches amongst others. Restaurants such as Pedro are among the highlights of Elat, which buzzes with activity like any self-respecting beach town. After you finish driving or sailing in the Red Sea, you kick back at the beach or at one of the many inviting spaces that dot the town. As the night lights faded, into another sunrise, we headed to one of the major tourist attractions in Elat, the Coral World Underwater Observatory. We're headed down now into the Underwater Observatory to see what it's like to be amongst the corals. And I know I'm going deeper because, can you hear this? You can literally hear the water beating against the sides. This is just amazing. I'm right amongst the corals. And this is actually, it's not a replica, it's not an aquarium. I am underwater, in the sea, amongst the corals, I'm just watching all the fish.
The underwater observatory sits on the coral reserve, actually in it. With a variety of displays, there's much to see and learn, but the most jaw-dropping ones are the underwater observatory tower and the shark pool. The underwater observatory allows you to step under the sea and stand amongst the colourful fish, stingrays, squid and other creatures that live in this coral reef. It's literally your window to the Red Sea and one can actually lose track of time there. But you can also get right up on the tower and get fantastic views of the shades of green and blue of the Red Sea. The shark pool is also fascinating and has ballroom-sized floor-to-ceiling windows that allow you to feel immersed in the underwater world, where sharks, stingrays and manta rays literally come eye to eye with you. You walk through an underwater tunnel as well, giving you a 360-degree feeling of being under the sea. It's a place that needs at least four to five hours to visit. But we were on a tight schedule for the day and were soon on our way again. The interesting sculptures of musicians at the circles at the Port of Elat caught our attention on the way out. Driving out of Elat, once again the Negev Desert surrounded us and we had a short 25km drive to Timna National Park. Everything in the new C-Class is quite modern. Everything is at the touch of a fingertip. I really like this panel over here, uh, below the screen, while all the functions are here. This one sort of works like buttons. It's, uh, it's quite intuitive when you have some of the easy access functions on it. Uh, the panel has the modes. And while I've been in comfort cruising around in the city, now on the highway, I like to have it in sport forms up my steering wheel, gives me that little extra oomph when I want the overtakes. So yeah, I quite like having this sport mode. Yeah, even the sunroof. One swipe, that's all it needs. And the sunroof is dual pane, so it really opens up the car and you know, even backseat passengers can really enjoy the views. The car here in Israel is slightly different from the C-Class in India, which I've just reviewed very recently. I noticed that we had the capacitive buttons for the seat adjustments, but over here it's manual. So yeah, just some of the functions are on the side of the seat and the slider is manual. The 15,000-acre Timna National Park unfurls the most magical desertscapes, complete with gigantic rock formations that have been carved by the wind. Timna was a major hub of metal production in ancient times, and the numerous mining shafts and tunnels that were bored to extract copper from the rocks testify to its significance. Massive sandstone pillars are not the only astounding sight at Timna. You also have curious formations such as the mushroom rock. Standing there under a harsh sun surrounded by these timeless monuments carved by nature, one gets reminded how little we matter in the larger scheme of this universe. About 25 kilometers from the deep blue of the Red Sea and Elat is Timna National Park. Now, this austerely beautiful park is a must-visit place because it has thousands of years of geological activity. It also has copper mines and smelting furnaces. But what you can see behind me is nature's glory, which is amply displayed in the form of these massive sandstone formations called Solomon's Pillars. Now, in modern day times, our cars, like these Mercedes Benz, go through wind tunnels to be shaped. But as you can see from behind me, nature has been doing this for years. Timna's bluffs, valleys, and rock formations offer some of the best short desert hikes anywhere in Israel. There are more than 20 trails of varying lengths and difficulties to choose from. For those who love cycling, these trails are really great too. And believe me, this place has to be seen. Nature is astounding. But that feeling was only further amplified as we continued our journey through the Negev Desert into the largest erosion crater in the world. Uh, I'm driving through the Maktesh Ramon crater and ahead of me you can see the rim of this crater. It's pretty incredible because it is massive. It is huge. And all around me, the landscape is 
very, very alien. Named after the first Israeli astronaut, Ilan Ramon, one of the seven crew members of the Columbia Space Shuttle that disintegrated upon re-entering the Earth's atmosphere in 2003, this crater has not been created by impact, but by erosion. In fact, the word makdesh in Hebrew means mortar and pestle because it's believed to have been created 220 million years ago and is over 40 kilometers long, 10 kilometers wide and about 400 meters deep. It certainly looks like someone has ground this out into the earth and it makes for a very dramatic visual. A short drive away from Mitzpe Ramon, the gateway to Maktesh Ramon, is Kibbutz Teboka. David Ben Guiron, Israel's first Prime Minister, was so inspired by the pioneering spirit of this kibbutz that he chose to spend the last 20 years of his life here. He was laid to rest a short distance away from the kibbutz, surrounded by lush green lawns and landscaped walkways. A cool evening breeze surged through the complex that houses this tomb. The views all around were spectacular and the silence was almost meditative. The desert camp at Kfar Hanoktim, which spotlights the culture and customs of Bedouins, welcomed us weary travellers in the evening. At Kfar Hanoktim, you can choose to stay in traditional Bedouin-style community accommodation or cosy cottages. The experiences offered are plenty, the food tasty and traditional and the staff helpful and friendly. And one particular experience of scorpion spotting in the surrounding desert was an eye-opener in more ways than one. As we headed out onto the desert on foot, our guide told us that scorpions are only land based creatures that glow when a UV light is directed at them. And then he upturned the rocks at our feet and proceeded to do just that. There it was, the master of camouflage all aglow. Impossible to spot otherwise, either during day or night. The scorpions are rendered vulnerable by the beam of UV light. Now, according to scientists, scorpion's exoskeleton contains a layer called a hyaline that reacts to ultraviolet light, causing its body to glow. But switch the torch off and you'll never be able to spot it. Obviously, all of us were really cautious on our way back to the desert camp where we ended the night with a coffee before bedtime in a traditional Bedouin tent, listening to tales about the people narrated by a feisty Bedouin woman. journey is now headed up north. Uh, we cross the town of Arad and then we get onto Route 6 and we go towards Haifa and we travel along the Mediterranean Sea. So yeah, it's Dead Sea, Red Sea and Med Sea. We left Kfar Hanoktim and the desert behind and the sparsely populated single-lane roads now turned into highways. Small towns appeared on either side of the road and we were seeing the most amount of cars and people we had seen in three days. The brown of the desert was now beginning to be replaced by a soothing Mediterranean green and we even encountered our first traffic jam as we headed up north. And I'm back in the GLA today. Uh, Hormuz has taken over the wheel of the C-Class. And it's kind of nice to be in this car as well. You get more height, visibility is good across the road. And yeah, I really don't have to worry about going off-road and you know, on the rougher sections. I can just trundle through them in this one. But there was really no more off-roading. Instead, it was all highway. Highway 6 or the Trans-Israel Highway is 204 kilometers long and helps travelers bypass the congested Tel Aviv region. The toll road is relatively new and was operationalized in 2002. But the larger intersections get very crowded and traffic moves slowly past them. Highway 6 runs along the eastern part of Israel from Beersheba to the Galilee in the north. And our destination for the day was the charming city of Haifa. Just when you think that this country has nothing else to top your last experience, it completely surprises you.
often known as the San Francisco of Israel, Haifa is its third largest city. It's set up high on Mount Carmel and what it's famous for is what you see behind me, the Baha'i Gardens. Now this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it's a place of holy pilgrimage for the Baha'i community. The Baha'i Gardens in Haifa are a study in exquisite landscaping and architecture. The gardens, a riot of colour in spring, compromise a staircase of 19 terraces that extend all the way to the northern slope of Mount Carmel. The Baha'i Gardens, visited by millions every year, is home to the Gold Dome Shrine of the Bab, the forerunner of the Baha'i Revelation. In Acre, further up the coast, you'll find the resting place of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. According to an old Israeli saying, in Jerusalem they pray, in Tel Aviv they party and in Haifa they work. Haifa is one of Israel's largest port cities, much admired for its multiculturalism. It's not just a city where one works, it is full of life, especially around the tree-lined German colony that is studded with restaurants and boutiques. With great views of the Baha'i Gardens and the Shrine, it is also a place to end the day. We ended ours at the lively Duzan, which not only does great continental food, but also celebrates the cuisine of the region. Each day of this journey had been a spectacular one so far. There was history all around. The roads were engaging, the scenery spectacular, and tying everything together was the warmth of the people and the food. Our route out of Haifa today wound itself gently along the Mediterranean Sea and it was a fantastic road. Our breakfast by the sea was just wonderful. And just before our last destination of the day, Acre, we've stopped off at Rosh Hanikra. Want to know why? Well, I'll tell you soon. Today would be our last day in Israel and it would take us to the border in the north with Lebanon. We truly had done a lap of the entire country. ago we witnessed the power of wind at Timna National Park and today here at Rosh Hanikra which is on the Israeli border with Lebanon right up north we're witnessing the power of water the Mediterranean Sea has been pushing into these lanes over thousands of years creating these caves and grottos it's quite fascinating The ultra green blue water set against the chalky white cliffs and the water rushing inside and pooling in the grottos is a stirring sight. A grand spectacle of light and sound. The guides call it a love story between the sea and the rock. And they're entirely justified in calling it that. Alongside the grottos, one can also view the remains of a railway line and the tunnel built by the British that connected Haifa and Tripoli in Lebanon. From Rosh Hanikra to Acre takes about 40 minutes and the last stop in our long journey was a memorable one. Acre, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, is a walled city by the Mediterranean featuring baths, citadels and mosques. A variety of people have coveted and conquered it. The great Napoleon failed despite trying hard. But it is the Crusaders who have perhaps left the biggest imprint. Acre was once a major crusader stronghold and one can see the remains of it here both below and above street level. A walk through the old city is like walking through time. There are many signs of all the different conquerors who ruled Acre. The Roman architecture, the British prisons, the Turkish baths. And as one walks through the opulent baths with separate sections for the genders, one can hear the murmurs of women and men lounging and enjoying and chatting with their friends. 
The walk through the bath led us out into a colourful, noisy, bustling bazaar with spices and sweetmeats, knickknacks and souvenirs. And hours can be spent in this bazaar that leads out onto the waterfront where fishing boats are lined up and tourist boats take you for a cruise. Well, it's two hours to catch my flight to Bombay and I'm ending my trip in this lovely colourful bazaar here in Akko. What a wonderful journey this has been and I know when I go back to India, people are going to ask me, Israel, really? How was the country and what did you do there? Well, I will have so many stories to tell because we've driven over 1000 kilometers. We've been up in Jerusalem, then we went down to the Dead Sea, finally to Elath in the south, back up to Haifa in the north and here in Akko finally. It's been a fabulous journey from the blues of the seas to the browns and reds of the desert, the animals, the food, the people, the warmth that I felt in this country. I'm going to have indelible memories to take back with me.